So today, uh, as you guys know, I usually go for subtle and for hidden. Um, and so there's, there's a couple of things I want you to do today, right? There's a couple of things I want you to do today. And, and I want you to guess what they are. Anybody have a clue? A free... Think, what was that again? All right, I'm giving you the end of the quiz here, okay? You've got the, the answers to the quiz. And I'm going to ask you at the end and throughout the service what I'm asking you to do. And when I ask you what I'm asking you to do, you're going to say we're going to think kingdom and think Jesus. This is how real change comes. And so get ready, all right? So I, I want to, um, to lead you through thinking kingdom and thinking Jesus. I want to lead you to, to know how to do that in... Um, in five difficult steps, not four. Uh, I wrote four, and, and uh, Marcia's really having a bad, bad day. I had to run home, and, uh, and I came back, and I didn't change it. So there's a freebie for five. But we're not giving them to you easy. Four easy payments. Any of y'all recognize that? You know, <laughs> those payments could be really hard, but I'm just going to be straight with you. These are not going to be easy things. They're going to be difficult things, but they're awesome, and they change everything. And if you'll listen to what God will say to you today, and if you'll learn to think kingdom and think Jesus, everything changes for you from this point forward. Your whole interpretation of life, the joy that you live through the pain of life, everything changes if you'll learn to interpret and see life differently, thinking kingdom and thinking Jesus. So how do, how do you do that? Well, first of all, um, it's supernatural, and you have to be born again. You can't do this in your own strength. You can't do this in your own logic. You can't do this in your old broken. Something supernatural has to happen. You have to be born again. In John 3.3, 3, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. I don't know how much you've ever thought of the phrase kingdom of God. <clears throat> But I want to introduce you to the phrase, reintroduce you to the phrase, remind you of the phrase, and challenge you to let it be at the forefront of your thinking the rest of your living, the kingdom of God. Because there's two realms that we are alive in. We are alive in the kingdom of the world. And the scripture talks about a prince of the air who rules the kingdom of the world. So there is one way of living and being and valuing and thinking and getting ahead in the world. And then there's the invasion of love in Christ who brought the kingdom of God. This kingdom of God is very strange compared to the kingdom of the world. This kingdom of God is very different. It's very unlike. It's, it's almost like opposite in every way. Uh, one is seen, one is unseen, one is temporary, one is eternal, one is self-centered, one is Christ-centered. They're very different, these two realms or spheres of living, thinking, being, seeing, doing. And we have to, to choose which is going to be our realm. But in the realm of the kingdom, um, you know, you can kind of maybe see it from afar through your own logic or whatever else, but you, 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 can't, you can't truly grasp it or see it or enter into it unless something profoundly spiritual happens with love in your life. You got to meet Jesus. And you got to meet Jesus in more than a religious kind of way. You got to you got to to hear Jesus knocking on the door of your life. Revelation three twenty says, "Behold, I stand at the door and I knock." And if anyone hears my voice um, and opens the door, I will come in to them. Now it's not only Jesus knocking; it's Him calling. Have any of you all ever been at home, uh, like on a Saturday, or maybe you, you've been home at the, uh, you know, during the week and somebody knocks on the door and you hid? Anybody ever done that? Come on, own it. You know, never, yeah. I, w I was home the other day at an odd time and somebody came to the door and it's like, I'm not dressed for this and, and honestly, I don't want to talk to you right now, you know? Um, I, don't, I don't mean to be rude and... and um, and so I'm peeking around, and he's looking through, and I'm going, hi, you don't see me. Uh, but that's, that's our, our choice with Jesus. That not only does he knock on the door of our life through the evidence of creation, through uh, the revelation of Scripture, through every encounter of love in your life, that's Jesus. 
Um, not only does he knock on the door of his, our lives, he calls us. He speaks our name. He, he tells us about love. And, and we have a choice to, to ignore the door or open it. And, and contrary to even, you know, the salesman, because that's not what Jesus is, we don't just leave him at the entrance. We invite him in, and, and in fact, we give up the house. It's no longer ours, but his. So this is a radical spiritual step, but this is how we see the kingdom. See, the reality is that beginnings require endings. You can't get to chapter 2 in a book until you finish chapter 1. You've got to turn the page. And, and, and in, in the kingdom of God... We have to leave the kingdom of, of the world. We can't enter the kingdom until we reject life in a broken world. If we're accepting life in a broken world, happy in a broken world, at peace in a broken world, trying to find our way in a broken world, building our own life in a broken world, we'll never see the kingdom of God because you, you got to leave it completely. And that's one of the reasons why some of us here are not as spiritually empowered or alive or, or living in full color as we could is because we're still in the world. And, and, and you know, we know some things about God, but we're not living supernaturally uh, in the kingdom. Scripture puts it this way, this radical division between old and new, between last and next, between earth and, and, and heaven. In Romans 6, 3 through 4, we, we were able to baptize four people in the last service. It's awesome. Um, and the scripture says, Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? When you're believing in Jesus, you're not just beginning, um, you know, some, some knowledge journey. You're committed to an ending. You're making a commitment to live your life in a different way. Quick pause. We have three different congregations at the Church of Seven Run. Our statistics show us, shows us, our data shows us that, that the average seven runner attends once every three weeks. Well, again, this is not legalism or anything else. I'm just simply saying, uh-uh, anymore, okay? You're supposed to say sure. <laughs> okay. No, what I'm saying is, is that there's a commitment that it takes to follow Jesus, and a part of that commitment to follow Jesus is to be in the body of Christ, not only for what we get out of it, which is what we usually think as consumers, uh, but for how God might use our life and our conversation to be a blessing to somebody else. And that's a part we often don't think. You and I are called in the kingdom to serve. And, and to be in the kingdom, it requires a commitment. So I'm, I'm asking you, just quick aside, up your commitment. All right? We leave this world... To enter the kingdom. We die. We no longer buy into its systems or its values. We no longer um, invest in what it's selling. Um, we no longer see uh, beauty in what it's trying to, you know, lead us towards. We see beyond the broken of this world and we see the beauty of the kingdom. And, and so we give up our lives willingly and we die to our life in this world. We die to self-control. Uh, we die to self-will. We die to to everything that is a self-guided uh, life that doesn't need God. We die to all that. We're baptized into the death of Jesus. Jesus' death was unambiguous. It wasn't iffy. You know, um, we're pretty sure he was dead by the fact that he wasn't breathing anymore. And, and there was a spear rammed through his side. And, and the scripture is very specific in its, its graphic detail that blood and water came out. He was dead dead, dead. And, and that is the beginning place of life in the kingdom of God. You and I have to die to the old that we can enter the new. You can't have a resurrection without a finished crucifixion. So don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism in, into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, that we too may live a new life. So I just want to, I want you to see the cost of the kingdom. It's the cross and your death. And the gift of the, the grace of God in response to your willingness to give up your life is, is a whole new resurrected life that never ends. That's the coming of the kingdom. 
And the supernatural at work in, in heaven is the same as the supernatural at work on earth. Nothing's dumbed down, dialed back, or diluted. The kingdom of God that came in Christ is the same kingdom of God that can come in us. I'm going to ask you to stand with me for a minute, and I don't want us to pray together the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. And I want you to, to think about what you're being invited into in these words of Jesus. Again, Jesus, I don't believe, gave us this prayer as a rote thing that we say thoughtlessly, but as each one of these words, an open door into an endless journey, endless truth, endless beauty behind that door. And as we open them by faith, we enter into uh, just uh, this endless God-revealing reality. So this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You may be seated. So the core prayer that we're invited to pray, not in a meaningless way, is your kingdom come. Not in, in, you know, the, the vagaries of life on earth, but in my life. In my imperfect life, in my broken world, Jesus, may your kingdom come to cover my broken past, to cover my woundedness and my pain. Jesus, may your kingdom come to deal with the, the challenges of my marriage and my child, my children, to deal with those people at work. Jesus, may your kingdom come and your will be done. And I don't mean in a, in a little small way. Guys, here's the lie of hell. The lie of hell is that evil is strong and good is weak. And I got to admit, there's, you know, there's behind every lie, there appears to be some truth. And, and evil happens so quickly and it's so devastating and good seems to take so long and it seems to be, you know, so, so slow and easily undone. But that's simply not the case. Your kingdom come. On earth as it is in heaven, your will be done in the same way that the, the glory of God the infinite speaks a word and his word is done. Whether it's through the obedience of angels acting or whether it's just the power of God's spoken word alone saying, let there be light. And there was light. There is power associated with the word of God, the, the, the building of his kingdom. And the power that's associated with God the infinite is, is also given to you and I in the kingdom. There's nothing dialed back, nothing diluted, nothing dumbed down. God's will for your life is that you do two things. Are you ready? You, you're there. You ready? Ready, ready? No, no, no. You're right. You're right. You're right. We got to think kingdom and think Jesus. And when we do that... I'm going to get you again, so be ready. <laughs> when we do that, God's kingdom can come in our lives and in our marriages and in our challenges and in our feelings and in our hurt and in our anger and in our woundedness and in all the challenges of life in the exact same way as it is in heaven. That's the word of God. That's the statement of Jesus Christ. And either it's true or it's not. But do you see how kingdom-centered Jesus is? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Guys, I want to just say one of the things that, is, that changed my life early on was recognizing the two spheres, the two realms, the, the, two, the two realities of the kingdom of the earth and the kingdom of heaven. And then realizing I had to make a, cho a choice uh, between which one was going to dominate my life. So, so the second, um, you know, step, difficult step to... to thinking kingdom is to live sick of the lifelessness of life on earth. And I'm not talking about being a sad sack or an Eeyore. I'm not talking about being depressed or, or not full of life. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm talking about seeing through what's empty. It's like in the story, the emperor has no clothes. Well, we're the ones who just acknowledge the truth that the emperor has no clothes. And in that reality, we, we're not afraid to call something what it is. 
and to look for the truth beyond. In Ecclesiastes 1-2, the teacher says, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. And, and what he's saying is that apart from God and the fullness of God's life, everything on earth is meaningless. That in the end, it counts for nothing. That, that you get what you want, then you don't want what you got. That, that, that life without God's touch is a life untouched. It's a life alone. It's a life of hunger. Life outside of God's table is, is a life of perpetual soul hunger. And if you want the kingdom, then you've got, to, you've got to kind of cultivate a sense of holy discontent in your life. Not that you're dissatisfied with people around you and everything. You're, no, no, no. But it's a holy discontent to say, I can't find my bread in the garbage of this world. I got to go to the table of the king. And, 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 there is this emptiness that we feel if we're honest inside of us that, that we, we understand. The teacher in, in Kohelet in, in Ecclesiastes 3.11 says he has said eternity. God has placed eternity in the hearts of people. So inside of all of us, um, uh, sometimes stuffed down deep and, and dialed way back, but inside of all of us there is this, we know that we're eternal. We know that we were made for more than this. We know that that, that there is meaning and that our souls matter. But if we trade the truth of the eternal for the temporariness of a broken life in time, then we've missed everything. The way we think kingdom is to live sick of the lifelessness of life on earth. Haggai 1, 5 through 6 says, Now, therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much but harvested little. Any of y'all ever felt like that? Worked really, really hard and didn't get much in return for it? I mean, you know, I, it's amazing how relevant Scripture is. <laughs> you, um, you eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. Uh, you put on clothes, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put in a purse with holes in it. And that's the nature of life on earth. You're trying to fill a bucket that's perpetually leaking. <laughs> and a wise person eventually recognizes that there, there's a leak in the bucket and, and they plug it. An unwise person just keeps pouring stuff in and wondering why. The scripture teaches us that there is an emptiness to this world separated from the love of God. And we all feel it. You feel the emptiness inside. You feel the discontent. You were made for Eden. You know that, right? You were made for Eden. You were made for life in the presence of, of Father. You were made for the glory of, of God. And, and we have been ripped out of that and are living east of Eden. We are living in a broken world, a, a spiritual desert. And that's what Jesus was talking about in a sense in Matthew 5, 4 when he said, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Some people will live their whole life um, and whether it's drinking or drugs or, or just stupid sexuality, whether it's obvious things, maybe it's things that are less obvious, they distract themselves with other things, but they'll live their whole life scratching around in the barnyard of this world, you know, for, for scraps and, and they'll think that's all there is to it. Other people will, will get in touch with, with the truth within them, the eternity set in them, and they'll say there has to be more. <laughs> there has to be something greater. There, there has to be an answer to the pain I'm in. And Jesus says, yes, there is. So face your pain and own it. And know that you're blessed in recognizing the emptiness of life apart from me. And you're going to be comforted one day. Just endure. Look for more. Look for more. Because I, I really want you to do two things with your life. I, 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 I want you to... All right, several of you are getting A's. Look for more. Look for eternity in the ordinary because the kingdom of God has come. We're not dead anymore. 
We're not defeated. We're not down. We're not living in a gray world. We're now living in a world in, in which the, the kingdoms are colliding, but the kingdom has come, and we're now alive in full color. We're now alive in, in the power of heaven. Love has come. And although we're still uh, living in, in broken, we're still living in imperfect, we're still living in a world that is empty around us, now we can live in the kingdom through this journey, and everything changes. So, so in looking for more, Jesus put it this way, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will be given to you. In your journey through, through the world, I want you to think kingdom. Seek my kingdom in, in your relationship. Seek it at work. Seek it in school. Seek it in, in everything you do. Seek my kingdom and, and my righteousness. Everything that's right about me and everything else I, I'm gonna put into place. So what are you looking for in life? Because you're going to try to find your life somewhere. You will find your life somewhere. You're going to, you're going to have some source in your life. And, and James put it this way. He said, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? And anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world chooses to be an enemy of God. So we have to make a choice. And we have to commit to the kingdom of God or to the crumbling of this world. Third, the way that we think kingdom and, and think Jesus is that we learn to distrust what we think and feel. Now, that may sound odd to you, but I want to share with you that the path towards trusting God is also a path of learning distrust. And the way we learn to trust the heart of God is we learn to distrust our own heart and our own feelings. And it may be counterintuitive, but the truth is your natural interpretation of, of people and things and events is always going to be wrong. Why? Because it's natural. And the kingdom is supernatural. You guys are listening. Yay! The kingdom is supernatural. And so this is about simple humility. It's not about denial. We're not talking, please listen very carefully, okay? Uh, uh, I know I'm not the most handsome thing to look at, but all eyes are right up here. Okay? This is not about denial. We're not asking you to not feel what you feel. No, you, you, you spend your life running from what you feel and you're spending your life um, running into dysfunction and brokenness. And, and you're going to be tied up in knots and chains and you're going to wreck people's lives around you. You got to face what you feel. Jesus is never about denial. But what I'm saying to you is, is that it, it's about simple humility. And, and recognizing that I'm not God. You see, James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The proud are the people who think their feelings and their thoughts are the way it is. I mean, seriously, like politically, we all think we're the center and everybody's to the left or the right of us. We do that all the time. Unconsciously, we put ourselves in the center and, oh, they're a liberal. Oh, they're, they're, they're a conservative, you know. They're too far this way. They're too far that way. Well, how do you know? Because I'm in the perfect center. And, and seriously, like, we all love to be right and let people know we're right. Hello, Facebook. And our opinions on things, that's the truth, right? You want to know the truth? Come to me and I'll give it to you. Sit down and, and, and sit at my feet, oh people. And, 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 and that's the kind of attitude we have about things. Like, my opinion is what matters. Really? What does it mean to know you're not God? I mean, that may sound funny to you, but I'm seriously, think about this. What does it mean to know and to say, I am not God? I'm, I'm just a speck of dust on a spinning ball in an infinite space for a second or two. God is God, and I am not him. And, and Scripture goes on really specifically to say in Isaiah 55, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. And there's a whole lot of people who, who don't believe this Scripture because I know exactly, you know, I can tell you every one of God's thoughts. Well, maybe not. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. What? As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
And what this does for me uh, is early on in my spiritual journey, I begin to learn to distrust my own thinking and my own feeling. And it puts, puts me in a position of seeking rather than, than arrogant assumption of knowing. And, and, it, and it begins every decision and it begins every, um, you know, every encounter or every even processing thought from a, a place of the bended knee that I yield to God. And, and I'm not God. I don't know. You know, it's, it's like, you know, one domino falls and we think we're in control. You don't know where the next domino falls and the next and the next and the next. So, so you bend your knee to God and you acknowledge, I'm not you, God. And, and I'm bound in time. You're from all of eternity. I'm looking at life from sea level. You're seeing it from 50,000 feet. You're seeing it from the in, infinite uh, stretch of, of the expanse of the stars in heaven. I, I see only my moments, my pain. You see the end from the beginning. You're the alpha and the omega. You're weaving all things together and bringing everything together successfully in Christ. And I have a choice in my life to, to live broken in the dust of earth and then finally buried in it or to yield and to live a God-guided life that is a part of the coming of the kingdom and is to the glory of the king. So I don't go by my opinions of, of anything. I don't trust my opinions of you. I don't trust my opinions of myself. Um, I don't trust my feelings. I feel what I feel, um, but I work hard not to act on those things because they're crazy sometimes. Some of y'all are there too. All y'all are there too, really. And, and, and I, I just want to say, when you think kingdom, you really become much less judgmental. Some of us here need to just repent of how arrogant we are and how critical we are. We've got to have an opinion on everything. Stop it. Okay? Really, nobody needs to know what you think. They really need to know what God thinks. And you can spend your life in insecurity um, trying to earn status or respect or something or other, I don't know, um, you know, working hard to let everybody else know what you think and persuade them you're right, or you can bend the knee and yield your life to the coming of the kingdom and let your language be a part of the king coming in somebody else's life. Let other people hear God's thoughts and his love and here's the other thing. You don't know what you think you know. You know, somebody the other day, um, you know, called up somebody and, and said, did you know Gwen Hubbard is leaving the Church of Seven Run? No. And the reason I don't know that is because it's not true, you know. I, w you look at some situation, you know, and you think, oh, I, I can't believe they're doing that. One man uh, on the subway, true story, um, New York City, he's on the subway and he's got like four kids and the kids are just running crazy up and down the car, subway car and the man's just standing there with his head in his hands and the people around are just getting angry and the one across from him is especially just really getting angry. That's not how I was raised. You're supposed to control your kids. What kind of a dad are you? You, you must be an idiot to let your kids loose like this. And he finally, the guy had enough, and he blows up in judgment to the guy across the, the, uh, the, 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 the seat from him on, on the subway and, and, and gives him his full mind, gives him a piece of his mind. And, and the man looks up and says, oh, I'm so sorry. We just came from the hospital, and the kid's mother just died, and I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of reeling from it. Oh, I didn't know. Well, darn right you didn't know because you didn't ask and you didn't love enough to, to care to ask. So in the name of Jesus, stop thinking your own thoughts, okay, guys? And stop trusting the natural when the supernatural has been given to you in the kingdom. Fourth, look for paradox. The uh, staff gets really tired of me uh, saying this all the time. Um, everything resolves into paradox in the kingdom of God. Um, and, and really that's a paradox because when something resolves, there's no more tension in it, right? But if it resolves into paradox, then it's resolved into tension and that's not really a resolve, but that's what it does in the kingdom of God. And so a paradox is a tenet contrary to a received opinion, a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense and yet is true. You want to find your life according to Matthew 10.39? You got to lose it. 
Well, that didn't make sense in the world. Me first. <laughs> I'm in the lifeboat first. No, Jesus said, you want to find your life, you lose it in the world. Matthew, um, Mark 10, 44. You want to be the greatest of all? Well, this world tells you how to be the greatest of all. You know, you want to be the greatest of all? Well, you tell people how great you are and you let them see your greatness and you, you do all you can to, you know, to exert your power over. Uh-uh. No, you want to be the greatest of all? You be the servant or the least of all. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. You want to be strong? Own your weakness and offer it to God in humility. <laughs> And instead of living defensively and arrogantly and trying to present to everybody that you got it all together, you just walk in your broken, offered surrender to Christ, redeemed, and you watch Jesus reveal his strength through you. Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. And that is glorious. Look for the paradox, for what's whole behind what's broken. Lastly, in the face of overwhelming complexity, Return to simplicity. Like you see, there's two things I want you to do today. I want you to... Uh -huh, I set you up. I set you up clearly. I gave you plenty of time. Take two. There's two things I want you to do today. And learning to think in these terms changes everything. In the face of overwhelming complexity in the kingdom of God, return to simplicity. In Matthew 18, 3, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. How many of y'all were little and just couldn't wait to grow up? You know, somebody's telling you what to do and you say, I can't wait till I'm grow up and nobody's going to tell me what to do. Then some of you crazy people went and joined the military. Oh yeah, nobody's telling you what to do there. Yeah, so, so you're a little kid. I just want to grow up. Oh, yeah, welcome to bills and work. You know, that's freedom. <laughs> Unless you change and become like a little child, you'll never enter the kingdom. It's returning to a place of simplicity and trust and a relationship with, with God that is, that is personal. It's, it's what's next, Papa. In Matthew 6, 25 through 34, uh, Jesus says this. He says, um, you know, in the face of overwhelming complexity, I don't know how many of you all have ever been actually hungry. Um, I really challenge you. If you think you're poor, travel to the third world and, and then evaluate your, your poverty. I'm not saying that, that some of you aren't and some of us aren't. I'm not saying some of us aren't suffering. I'm just saying seriously, when there is a regular hungry season in your life and you can't feed your kids... Therefore, I tell you in the kingdom, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about the body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Jesus, do you understand how complex this is? I can't feed my kids. Do you understand what's going on at job? Do you understand my income and outgo ratio? Do you? Do not worry, Jesus says. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? In Philippians 1, 21, Paul, the, the really the most effective apostle that we have, um, is now in chains, and, and he's the only apostle going to the world. The rest of them are all kind of centered in Jerusalem, and he's in chains and other people are out preaching the gospel, a false gospel, and they're getting rich. That's been done from the beginning, and it will be to the end. People will use the gospel to make money for themselves, selling stuff. And Paul says, well, I praise God, whether from false motive or true, Christ is preached. All the complexity of, of Paul's life and his future and, and the necessity of getting the gospel out to Spain and the rest of the world, and he's sitting on a stone bench. And Paul says this, to live as Christ to die is gain. And you return to a simplicity that is not simplistic. Simplistic means that you've overly reduced something beyond the truth of its essence or core. Simplicity is different. It is recognizing the essential truth of the core. What is, what is the base? What is the center? Jesus on the cross. A world to save. 
the infinite complexity of billions of lives to redeem, all of the power of hell coming against him with all of the intelligence of beings who've been from eternity past with God and have seen his heart and plans, all of that Jesus is up against. And what does he say? Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So often Satan will succeed in paralyzing you when Father wants you to return back to the simplicity of the kingdom, the essence, the core, you are his child. And I'm telling you the truth, for me in times that I have been just paralyzed with the complexity and, and the depth and the weight of things, sometimes for me my relationship gets this simple. What's next, Papa? And I raise my hand up and I take my father's hand. And I imagine like walking across a, a, uh, a busy street, <laughs> like trying to get across 170 at rush hour. Papa's not going to let me get killed. No good father would. They're going to take their child's hands and when it's safe, lead him across. There's two things I want you to do for life today.